hello everyone. Welcome to the governor's panel. Um, I think these guys may probably don't need a real introduction, but if you want to go through real quick, to talk about what you guys do at your respective companies. Oh, uh, sure. My name is Robert. I'm a co-founder of Polkadot. So Polkadot is sort of a next generation blockchain for scalability and interoperability. Um, I do a lot of dev and research work on that project. Uh, Governance plays a big role in Polkadot because we consider a self-upgrading system uh, where we want to include like new research and scalability and in privacy and so on as we go. Uh, so I think this panel should be really productive to talk about that. Hello, my name is Will. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of ZeroX. I uh, originally started out doing a lot of development work and uh, more recently have transitioned to spending more time doing research and just organizational development. Uh, hi, uh, Jacob. Uh, work around the Tezos project, uh, mostly uh, doing uh, research around the governance mechanisms, uh, both current and uh, future. So uh, Tezos is essentially you know, a smart contracts platform or a programmable money, depending on where you sit. Or look, um, but uh, it, it, the goal is to create something that's self-amending. Uh, so the idea is that you can upgrade the protocol uh, without uh, resorting to a trusted third party. Hi, folks. So I'm the surprise guest, Stephen from uh, MakerDAO. I'm president. What we try to do is we establish a stablecoin ecosystem that helps to facilitate e economic growth on the uh, sort of Ethereum blockchain. But hopefully. With the likes of Polkadot, we can expand. Cool. Well, I think we should start things off very light. In a very short a few sentence, sentences, what does governance mean to you? Yeah, uh, so governance in a very abstract way is uh, how a organization adopts and manages its norms for dealing with problems and uh, how, how things should be addressed. So blockchains are inherently social organizations. It's uh, worldwide collaborations of people working on uh, finance or other transactions. Uh, so governance in the blockchain sense is really deciding how should these systems adapt to new technology and challenges as they arise. Yeah, I think, I think that pretty much captures it, a pretty good definition of, of governance. I would say maybe the one difference I would say I, I see is that instead of governance maybe just applying to organizations, I think it can also apply to like communities. So uh, groups of people that aren't necessarily bought into a specific organization, but just happen to be part of a community uh, through choice or through happen chance. Um, I really do think that governance, are, governance kind of boils down to like social norms. So if you look at like the US government, uh, at the very core of it, the very bedrock, it, it's just the U.S. Constitution, which is a piece of paper uh, it, with some things written on it, and people just agree to kind of go along with the things that are written on it. Uh, so I believe governance is basically social norms for communities. Yeah, so I, I think those are both, you know, sort of good, uh, like, angles at attacking the problem, but I think you can actually, if you, like, sort of step back further, like, I, I do actually like the Vlad Samvir uh, like lens uh, that he put out uh, it's one of the few things on governance that I, I think I agree with him uh, about is this idea of it being about the common knowledge around the legitimacy of decisions. Um, so I think you know if you think of it in the blockchain pro like uh, context, uh, it's you know you can start with even something as simple as consensus. Like consensus is in arguably you know given that um, you know b basically what are the rules that govern what goes in in blocks in the, in the blockchain, uh, and then you can also say you know how to you know basically introspect about the protocol. What are the rules that should be used to to govern uh, consensus or transactions or, or whatever. Uh, it is, um, you know, what what are the rules that are you that we use, or the rule set that governs, um, you know, how this thing changes uh, over time. Okay, what to add on to that? Let me think. So, for me, it's first identifying who your stakeholders are, and then characterizing how you can be accountable to them, and then finally creating your governance structure that allows you to implement that as efficiently as possible. So succinctly, that effectively is what governance is for me. Cool, so this question might be a bit late for most of you guys, but all the governance really starts off with a token distribution mechanism, whether that be ICOs, airdrops, Merkle mines, various things like that. Um, the current process has its flaws and various issues. I was curious to get your opinions on how you can prove that if maybe you were to redo it. 
Yeah, uh, so token distributions are especially important when you take into account systems like uh, coin voting. Uh, they're not as important when you start to move into things like identity-based systems or hash power voting systems or things like that. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it is very important to make sure that the, the token distribution is very equal, but you can, you know, even if it's not particularly great, you can also balance it, uh, for example, with uh, lowering the threshold or, or raising the threshold for, for acceptance uh, based on turnout and things like that, uh, just to make sure that you're actually dealing with, uh, like when you're dealing with parties who hold significant proportions compared to everybody else who's participating that they can't uh, hijack the system. Yeah, so I, I think token distribution is one of the things that we were really focused on early on in the project uh, when we were developing and launching 0x protocol on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, the kind of prevailing way of distributing tokens up until then had kind of been like uh, a project will you know, have some allocation of tokens and they kind of just put them up for sale at a certain block number and uh, people kind of flock in and, and try and get as many as they can as fast as possible. And like in some cases, you know, it would be like five or 10 different Ethereum accounts that would get, you know, they could take like the great majority of all tokens for a specific project. Now, not all of those tokens were like governance tokens, but uh, for Zero X protocol, uh, we're using a token based voting system. And so one of the things that we decided to do was to uh, basically provide a, uh, a ceiling on how, mu how many tokens any one person could purchase. Uh, and we basically forced people to go through this registration process, which was kind of a, f a somewhat effective Sybil prevention mechanism. Uh, and each person was able to purchase uh, in an equally divisible amount of the total amount that was available. So I think there was like 12,000 people that registered to participate and every single person was able to purchase up to one twelve thousand thousandth of the total supply. And so, the, you know, in our, in our minds, it was really important to maximize the distribution across as many people as possible. Uh, and also by kind of limiting the amount that any single individual or entity could purchase, you kind of, you kind of, uh, kind of filter out a lot of the speculators that are trying to just amass a ton of tokens so that they can just kind of go and sell them to someone else. Like, that's not really valuable for anyone. Um, so we were just focused on trying to get the people uh, that are actually gonna be using this, the protocol uh, and as many of them as possible uh, to be able to participate and, and purchase the tokens. Yeah, that, that's a really, I, I like that last uh, point uh, because the, the main thing, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, how these protocols gain their value uh, from network effects and from Metcast law and uh, the type, but whether or not the other people who are using this, you know, this network are also valuable to, you know, trade with or, uh, you know, collaborate with or use the, the protocol with, uh, I think really matters a lot, like the composition, like who are the users uh, and holders. But I think that the distribution question is really uh, interesting uh, in a governance perspective for two reasons. So one is that if you have uh, some situation, like there's a, there have been a lot of token sales uh, in the last, you know, however many months um, that basically they sell to private investors and you end up with like a situation where it's like there's no real community, like organic community. There's just a lot of folks, uh, there, there's just a lot of capital that's been deployed to sort of finance, you know, improving, uh, you know, building that building out the tech and bringing it to market. Uh, and it's sort of like this question of, okay, once this comes to market, uh, once this is, you know, this is a live protocol, um, you know, and, and if you're using some kind of, uh, you know, on-chain governance scheme or something like that, how do you, uh, like, convince all the future buyers of this token or future, uh, you know, participants in this network to believe that the governance system is not, like, sort of rigged in the favor of the original, you know, investors who bought in the beginning? And so this was, like, a big debate also, like, in 2017 through the whole, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, investment craze and, and everything. And um, this was, in Tezos, this was was a you know a, a really core tenet of how the fundraiser was set up. There was you know uh, you know sort of like this this sale you know a lot like thirty three thousand wallets uh, were, were uh, created uh, and basically uh, you know we have this really awesome wide you know distribution of tokens and and you know I think if you're and then I think on the other side there's the distribution question of okay if you you know you have a project that maybe it's like a one trick pony project you know you're sort of creating um, you know you're creating a better consensus algorithm but not selling it in any you know you're not 
not sort of talking about the technology much beyond that, uh, you're going to have trouble, you know, sort of creating something that uh, basically, if, if someone else has a governance mechanism that can in, in instantiate your awesome consensus idea, it will potentially get taken where the larger community, where the tokens are distributed uh, more widely, and where there's more value to using that, you know, really awesome consensus algorithm. So I think there's those two different angles of thinking about it uh, in the governance context. I think when it comes to certain organizations, you have to reverse engineer what the distribution is going to be best for you. In some cases, plutocracy is just inevitable, and you need to make sure that you have certain filters in place to actually work against it. But essentially, to quote from um, Xerox's article that they uh, published from uh, Mr. Zeitz, he mentions that you know what your approach should be would be effectively something between equity financing and a sort of consumer cooperative model. And what you've got to do is be able to say, well, what is it that is going to make sure that my organization actually survives and works and flourishes, but at the same time has a good balance of governance to be representative of what is ultimately good for that organization? So, you know, from MakeItOur's point of view, we've got that. We do have a certain amount of um, whale-like or plutocratic-like distribution, but effectively we negate it through a scientific governance process to make sure that whatever we discuss and whatever is put forward is vetted appropriately through some sort of rigorous debate that we ultimately can make sense about. Yeah, uh, just to add like a little bit on to, you know, the importance of, of distribution, uh, I think it's, it's also uh, very critical to think about like uh, proof of stake systems, like uh, contrasting that to like what everybody is aware of with proof of work is that you can just put hardware to work and get out some tokens and you don't actually need to buy them on an exchange or they don't need to be particularly accessible. You don't have to have uh, cryptos already in order to get any. Uh, so now as we transition to proof of stake, which has like a, a vast number of higher benefits, you know, less energy costs, you have faster efficiency to finality and so on. Uh, we need to design our economic mechanism such that as the distribution grows, that there are ways for uh, users who are new and don't have some kind of blockchain-based token already to uh, acquire some simply by putting their hardware to work. Cool. So you guys mentioned identity for a bit there. I think as regulations come through and as more things move forward, uh, identity is going to be a huge part of all blockchains, either on the uh, blockchain layer or the protocol layer. I'd love to hear your thought on like how would that affect the governance models in the near future. Uh, identity is a pretty tricky one because the state of most identity systems right now is uh, you know, usually based around things like uh, KYC or posting government documents or getting some kind of uh, attestations from official identity providers right now and getting those on chain. Uh, or they're in a very new state of, you know, let's just w build this web of trust and detach attestations from other users and uh, that sort of thing. So I think it'll be a while before identity technology becomes you know, something that we can actually integrate into blockchains, and that's simply because uh, identity is a very complex thing, and blockchains are not very good at understanding the world into which they're put. You know, we have very finite, uh, small state machines relative to the infinite complexity of the world, and it's hard to get those kinds of information uh, around identity and oracles and that sort of thing on there. Uh, so with that in mind, I think governance systems have to be designed with a roadmap where uh, it's possible to upgrade them. We say, you know, whatever we do with governance right now is not the end of our governance goals. We understand that uh, the systems around identity and voting are going to evolve and that we uh, need to be able to alter our governance process as things like identity become more nuanced and more possible to use in those scenarios. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think I, I think there's like two ways that identity can be tied into different blockchain governance or decentralized network governance systems. Uh, like the first, like I think the way that most people think about it uh, when you know we talk about like identity and governance on the blockchain is like every individual person has a public key, and everyone else knows that public key is associated with that person. And you can have things like democratic systems of governance. Uh, but I'm not convinced that you actually need to do that in order to have you know, the type of uh, kind of social accountability that is required for effective governance systems. So I, I think like one way we might see identity find its way into blockchain governance, like some of the very early first ways we might see it is through people self kind of 
deciding to uh, go and nominate themselves for an election. Uh, and maybe there's a committee of people that are focused on one aspect of governance within a community. And the people that decide to kind of participate and run in that election verify ownership of a specific public key. Uh, and in that case, there isn't any kind of strong relationship between identity and you know an account or or whatever on a blockchain. Instead, it's it's like very specifically people that decide they want to uh, show that information to the world that g can go and do that and remain socially accountable to their community. Yeah. Uh, yeah so without uh, you know speaking to like some of the, the like you know like the regulatory reasons people are implementing identity that sort of thing. I think in decision actual decisions that are made on chain, I think. One of the great strengths of this technology is that you can, part you know, it, it potentially with something like an on, you know, an on, -chain, on chain governance scheme, um, there's ways to participate uh, in this, uh, you know, governance scheme without having to reveal um, that you, you know how you voted or or, or what or what not. So we, we're not there yet. I mean, we have we don't have really have like receipt free voting. We don't have you know good you know mechanisms to you know obscure you know that that are deployed uh, today to obscure uh, how someone voted. Uh, in current uh, blockchain uh, governance, but I think in the future you'll see uh, blockchain governance that is, you know, sort of obscuring, you know, how different people vote. You just sort of see the outcome uh, after, a, you know, a given amount of time, uh, you know, if, if that's how the the system is designed. But I think that's actually a, a feature, like, sorry, you know, something that's that's very attractive uh, about this type of governance um, for a number of reasons that probably would take longer uh, than this panel to to go into, but. Uh, I, I think that's something that will be a big debate, you know, a, a very contentious, you know, point. Because, like, if you look at a lot of the debates in the Ethereum community, for example, around, uh, gov you know, ground governance, there's actually a lot of conversation about uh, basically like using identity uh, or using, uh, you know, ways to basically ways to prevent uh, civil attacks uh, on, uh, you know, different, you know, different uh, discussion forums or Reddit or, or whatnot, um, where, uh, you know, different proposals or, you know, uh, you know, changes to the protocol are being discussed. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of, there's, there's sort of the, the I, would, I would say there's sort of maybe some spectrum of like, maybe there's, you know, identity on, on one end, you know, where it's sort of like one person, one vote, um, you know, and you have, you know, sort of some kind of like something that really maps very closely to the real world. Um, and then you have, you know, in terms of decision making uh, mechanisms. And then on the other end, you have things like futarchy and, and things that are like very, it's all very abstracted away, like wh who and how this decision is being, you know, what are the, what the inputs are to this decision. I think we're going to see things entirely across the spectrum. Like I, I, I think, and I, and I think some of the most exciting opportunities actually lie in combining uh, some some parts, you know, so, so, so things maybe that use more identity um, and maybe, you know, are like more attached to uh, like, uh, you know, preferences around like, you know, you know, where people want blockchains to go, that sort of thing, uh, more normative questions. Uh, and then and then on the other end, like trying to sift out the truth, which like doesn't is sort of like not as, you know, will this specific uh, protocol change uh, actually increase increase throughput? OK, let's bet on in a, in a you know, prediction market, um, you know, and, and anyone can participate who has any amount of capital. So I think there will be really interesting experiments uh, along that spectrum. Uh, for me, self-sovereign identity is pivotal to the whole thing. Without it, basically, you cannot go ahead. I feel that the individual needs to own their identity before they should use it. So consequently, before that, the consequence or the idea of using identity on the blockchain can come forward in, um, in full display, it needs to be in the hands of the individual to begin with. Perfect, so both Tezos and Polkadot use this idea of on-chain governance and live upgrading. Uh, this question is for Rob for now, and uh, can you kind of take us through the entire process of a proposal all the way to it being deployed to a production net? Uh, yeah, sure thing. So uh, what we think of as Polkadot is not actually uh, really just what's described in the paper and what we implement right now. It's actually a, uh, like it's, it, it's not just a protocol for uh, scalability and running a bunch of blockchains in a network. It's also uh, sort of a meta protocol for upgrading this very state transition. So the way that it works is actually that the code describing the state transition of how a, a block is processed is actually stored on chain. Uh, so this means that we can have some kind of governance system which upgrades that code. Uh, so the way that that works in the current proofs of concept uh, is that we have some sort of uh, bicameral government where there's a uh, sort of technica technocratic council that's elected uh, via approval voting. It's got a fixed size. Uh, it's elected by coin holders. And then the 
Other house is a um, is a, just a simple coin vote, but it's weighted by turnout uh, in a way that the uh, threshold for uh, rejection grows quadratically with the percentage of turnout. Uh, so we found that that works pretty well. But the really nice thing about being able to upgrade the code is that we can actually have a self-upgrading uh, governance mechanism. So for example, uh, somebody could propose a transaction which will change the code of Polkadot to include a governance that implements Futarchy and liquid democracy and adds those as houses as well. Uh, so then this will go to the council. If it passes there, it'll go to the uh, coin voting system. If it passes there, then it is automatically applied and everybody can see that this change is actually canonical. Uh, so it's immediately binding the decisions that have been made. Uh, you could also add some kind of delay for people to uh, react to changes. So they say, oh, I don't like that change. And they, you know, if there's six weeks before it's applied, they can start to leave the system. Uh, or if not, it could be applied immediately. You know, there, there are definitely variables to tune there. Uh, but the really nice thing is just that it can basically alter itself. Cool. So as a follow-up for Jacob here is... Um Vlad recently wrote a several blog posts talking, especially mentioning autonomous on-chain upgrading and governance in that respect. He has some words to say about it that were not too kind, so I would love to get your thought, some counter arg arguments in that regard, maybe? Yeah, yeah, so, well, first let me just follow on um, uh, what Rob said about uh, how like, Polkadot works and just explain how, how Tezos works. So, um, and, and actually, let, if we back up, like, let's look at like wh what on-chain governance means in general. So I think there's typically what I've seen is like three major types, and it's not this is not exhaustive, but the first type of, on when people say on-chain governance, they mean uh, things like DAOs or uh, Aragon or even maybe the way Xerox works, things that are sort of made maybe more like the application layer of some, you know, or some kind of, uh, you know, on-chain uh, DAO or, or something like that. Um, and then you have things like EOS and Definity and projects where uh, there's basically, they're, they're the, you know, people are not, basically the participants are not only coming to agreement about, you know, state and about, uh, you know about uh, uh, you know pr future changes to the protocol. They're also making decisions uh, that are retroactive to previous decisions. So they're looking back and saying, "Oh, we're going to like you know th this smart contract is running a, a code uh, that hacker you know hackers are using or it's insecure or whatever, uh, and, and they can change balances uh, pretty seamlessly. Like there's people who are sort of have this ability to change balances uh, rather easily. Uh, and then in, in Tezos, the actually on-chain governance is sort of are aimed at something very specific, which is upgrading the protocol." Call. And it creates a very high. It has a very high bar for making those changes. So basically, uh, you know, there's proposals that are you know put out in, in, in code form. You know, probably going to be posted on GitLab or, or GitHub in, in a repository. Um, they, they'll be evaluated, then they'll be submitted uh, to uh, you know through the on-chain uh, mechanism. Uh, then uh, at, you know, basically, uh, the ba people who are participating in uh, proof of stake in Tezos, uh, which is called baking. <laughs> Uh, French project. Uh, basically, uh, they uh, do approval voting on to rank. Basically, and then you basically get a ranking of these different proposals. Uh, the the best ranked one then goes to another vote, and this is all based on 80% quorum. Uh, but that can be dynamically adjusted uh, based on previous uh, participation. Uh, and then it goes to a vote. Uh, and if 80% uh, of, of uh, those participating in, in the quorum uh, decide to put it onto a test net, basically then uh, all the, the Tezos uh, bakers, they run both uh, the, the test net and the, uh, the, lie, you know, the main net. And basically after a predetermined amount of time, uh, they can then switch, uh, you know, it, it, they'd vote again and then they, they can switch to the new uh, software. Uh, and basically, uh, that means that you know, obviously, the, this this mechanism is binding. Uh, you know, the decision that they make via this voting process is, is binding. Um, and uh, you know, then you can you know, Tezos can also you can make uh, changes to the the governance protocol itself through this way. Um, and that I think all of this will be uh, uh, quite interesting. But that's that's how it becomes autonomous. So to tie it into your your question, so why why do we want something like that? Like right, it's like this question of isn't existing blockchain governance going quite well? Um, you know, and, and I would argue it's 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 not that blockchain governance as it is now is so 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 bad. I actually think it, that all things considered, some aspects of it are like seem really bad, but actually aren't so bad, uh, sp especially forking. Uh, but I think that there's a lot that we're leaving on the table. I think that's the best way to understand it is that. Uh, by introducing sort of a new set of this new, you know, an, a binding on-chain process that we can actually make things more trustless 
uh, you know, and then actually not have to, you know, there's a lot of types of, uh, a lot of capital in the world that wants to come use blockchains or may want to in the future. Uh, but it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily want to use something where uh, it's you know where it's the 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 people who hold that capital they look back at you know existing protocols like Ethereum or, or Bitcoin or whatnot. They see this you know there's all these complexities. There there's all this uh, you know sort of uncertainty around what the future direction of that protocol is, and they might not want to. Uh, join, uh, you know, you use that network uh, to st whether it's store wealth, run an application, uh, or whatnot. And, and and the reason is because uh, you know with with forking based governance, you have issues around, say, for example, digital assets being, you know, if you create a fork of say Ethereum and you have all of the, one of the best articles on this was you know the idea of the evil twin. Uh, so you, you'd have say a crypto kitty on you know the Ethereum main chain, and then you know the fork happens, and then all of a sudden you have an, a crypto t uh, kitty on both chains, and it's like wh which one, you know, where 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 does does the crypto kitty uh, you know the people making the crypto kitty application like which like they then have to choose which one uh, only one blockchain can sort of have the 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 name uh, Ethereum <laughs> um, and and so like you end up with situations where uh, people sort of just want to stay with the existing uh, protocol and that that protocol you know the Ethereum agent for example is you know the roadmap of it is very much controlled by you know somewhat limited group of people. Um, you know, uh, all around the world, but who are you know talking publicly, but still are it's in very relatively in their control, um, and a lot of people uh, don't necessarily they, they don't view this as the reason a reason to to you know start using blockchains or they don't find this a compelling place to start using blockchains, uh, and so we we need to figure out how to solve uh, some of these challenges around you know making this something that you know has less trust around you know the the governance mechanism which uh, can you know can upgrade itself. Uh, without having uh, you know discretionary power in sort of a small group of hands. Got it. So uh, for Will and Steve, there's a lot of tokens in smart contract protocol there that are both a fee token and a governance token in many ways. I think Xerox is Xerox is one of these. And um, I was curious, what are your thoughts on this kind of hybrid token structure and how would they affect the future of gov governance for your protocols? Uh, Will. Yeah, so when we were originally designing 0x, uh, so, so we were originally designing 0, so I'm just gonna give a little bit of background on why 0x needs to have an upgrade mechanism. Uh, and then I'll kind of talk about how we, how we came to the conclusion that having the token, the governance token serve as a fee token was the right approach. Because uh, it's, not, it's not like a very intuitive thing, I think, uh, upon first glance. So, uh, my co-founder Amir and I were originally developing a for-profit decentralized exchange. It would be, we would own it, we would operate it, we would charge fees for people to use it. Um, and then as we spent more and more and more time in the Ethereum community and met with more projects, uh, like Augur, which is you know doing prediction markets, and Gnosis as well as is doing prediction markets, uh, the Maker team, and uh, Melonport, a variety, of, they, all, they all require exchange functionality in order to work. Uh, there just needs to be exchange functionality. And all of these projects were developing their own kind of custom implementations of exchange uh, for their specific application. And so, you know, we, we saw this yeah, as like a trend. It, you know, there are a lot of teams building their own, their own systems. And, you know, for an end user, this isn't very ideal because you have to trust, you know, many different smart contracts with your valuable digital assets, and they're all supposed to be doing the same thing. So it's not ideal. Uh, so at that point, we recognized that it would be much more useful to build a, a essentially a protocol or a system uh, platform for exchange that would allow anyone to build their own kind of decentralized exchange on top of it, marketplace, whatever. And But we recognized that Ethereum was still in its infancy, and we would need to upgrade these smart contracts very frequently. And the reason why is because, you know, not only is the Ethereum virtual machine constantly being upgraded and changing, the, the smart contract programming language is also changing. The token standards are always changing. So there was ERC-20 first, but now there's, you know, ERC-721 or uh, ERC-777-223. There, there's just so many of these things. Uh, so there needs to be a way to upgrade this system of smart contracts without forcing your users, the users of all these different applications, to migrate from one system to another system every six months or so. It's just not, it's not feasible. Uh, so we determined that if we're going to be building this system for all these different projects to use, 
And this system is going to have to be upgraded frequently. And those upgrades are going to kind of bubble up to the systems on top. There needs to be a way to have these different projects and the people that are using the system to weigh in on the decision making around that upgrade process. Uh, so, you know, having all these different projects using 0x and then just having like Amir and I on the couch somewhere making the decision to upgrade is like not a very good solution. Uh, so we determined that the best way to do it is through token voting of some form or another. And then the second question becomes, if you have a token that is being used to make important decisions that affect many other projects, many companies that exist in real life, you know, who are the people that you want to be holding those tokens? Okay, do you want like some random crypto fund that is just putting money into every single ICO that they find? Do you want those people making these important decisions? Like, no, you probably don't. You want the people that are actually using this system and have a vested interest in the system continuing to operate uh, and improve over time. So we thought of a variety of ways that could potentially push the token distribution into the hands of, of people that are actually using the system. But you know, basically what we determined was that the very easiest way for us to do this, at least in the short term, was to require that the people using the system to kind of do trades, uh, to enter into trades, you know, require those people to have a small amount of these tokens uh, at hand, and that will naturally push the token distribution over a wide body of people over time. So that was kind of the rationale behind why I have this governance token serve as a fee token. It's really a way of kind of like pushing out, flattening out the token distribution. Uh, whether or not that will be effective remains to be seen, but that was the way we were thinking about it, and I, I think that it's a, I think it, I, I think it was the right approach. Yeah, Steve, I think uh, you guys actually came with a very different approach than what you guys did, so I'd love to hear about how you guys thought about your token. So MKR as a token is effectively a governance token first and foremost, but um, in essence, you know, it does suffer from what most of the, the chaps here have been speaking about, you know, the, the effect of cartel, the effect of plutocracy, but in essence, it allows people to engage because the incentives are aligned very clearly towards a very common goal of stability kind of a all roads lead to Rome sort of situation where the roads are incentive and the Rome is effectively stability. Now, from that point of view, how do we make sure that we don't have someone taking over the system? How do we make sure that someone doesn't put a proposal forward to turn maker into an ice cream shop? Well, effectively, we have a security module that's in place as well. It looks at the proposal, it considers it and vets it from a rigorous scientific point of view. And it's that scientific governance that overlays the actual governance token that ensures that those incentives stay aligned with the point of objective being the stability of our coin. Um, it's worked. We've uh, already had a governance vote on the foundational paper. It's, uh, we have the application in place, and so far, so good. I just have a question. So is the, how do you ensure that there's not, so there's a trusted third party basically that evaluates the proposals, or is it like so you have some kind of decentralized system to, for scientific evaluation? So the first thing that you require is obviously a, what we call a risk team, right? Because the incentives that we put in place are directed towards very specific parameters, in our case, risk parameters. So we don't have a diverse parameter set which you have to permutate over to figure out which is the best. It's actually ideally very simple. It really boils down to the case of vetting if those parameters are clear and obvious and have a certain amount of scientific rigor be, uh, behind them. So what MKR token governance does is elect those risk teams. And essentially what you want is a, you know, a plethora of them. You want as many as possible. You basically want to have an aggregated forum where you have risk parameters chosen that are more robust than, if so, by just one risk team. Cool. Perfect. So delegation is something that's been done on um, many different layers, and honestly, the blockchain or the protocol itself really does not have control over delegation or not because there are companies built on top of um, protocols that are just doing delegation for other people, right? Like pools and stuff like that. So it does improve the user experience process a lot, but it can lead to a kind of inefficient polit political uh, scheme like what we have right now. So is there any way that maybe we can, like what are your thoughts around this? Do you want to avoid it or should we embrace this really? So the key issue with Delegation is typically a 
lack of accountability for the delegates. So you know you have to design something where if a delegate says that oh I'm going to do this and then you know their time comes around and they don't do that, they need to be held accountable. And that's something that we very clearly see in uh, representative democracies like America is that you know you have these. Uh, representatives who say they're going to do this and this and this, you know, they're going to lower the taxes and also raise a ton of money uh, and all that kind of stuff, and uh, they don't do it. And then the next two years, they're around doing exactly the same thing. So uh, something where you can pull away delegations very quickly, like liquid democracy, for example, or where you have futarchy for uh, voting on the uh, expected effectiveness of specific proposals is really going to nip that in the bud. Uh, the other thing we have is that just like uh, it's very hard to adapt these kinds of systems onto existing governments simply because they've been around for so long and they're so massive. Whereas we're using basically a new digital sandbox where we have like a ton of room for experimentation. We can try out all these new cool things. Uh, it's definitely going to be big testing and proving ground for a lot of these uh, ideas that have been floating around in the literature about uh, how to do uh, voting and delegation, make sure everybody's opinion is actually effectively heard. Uh, you know, so, so Tezos also has uh, the concept of del delegation, but there's actually some confusion around uh, like delegation in something like Tezos, delegation in something like EOS. So uh, in, in sort of like a, your traditional depots uh, system, like something like EOS, uh, you know, sort of there's, you know, uh, the token holders elect, you know, every, every two minutes the votes are tally, there's an approval vote, uh, and basically uh, a new set or possibly the same set as we've seen uh, block producers get, you know, are allowed to produce blocks, uh, and they share about 1% of, you know, there's sort of this 5% in inflation, 4% goes to on-chain treasury, 1% uh, goes to the block producers who are producing blocks uh, and endorsing blocks. And Tezos actually, so, so th the purpose of this is that you allegedly get, you know, accountability of these delegates, this small number of delegates, uh, and it gives you, allows you to, inf to, to impose very high overhead requirements, right, and it gets you lots of scalability, hypothetically. Um, great. Uh, but in Tezos, actually, delegation has nothing to do with scale. Like, it, it, it isn't, uh, it, uh, an objective is not to increase uh, scalability or, fa you know, give you faster finality or whatever. It's actually to share in inflation. So in, in Tezos, you know, there's this 5% uh, nominal inflation, 5.5% nominal inflation. And actually, uh, you know, you have these, all these delegates, you know, now, now there's 66 public delegates. There's 400 some odd uh, bakers. There's no fixed number. Um, and basically... They c you, you can basically uh, choose uh, one of them. They, you know, they typically, you know, uh, basically in Tezos you have two keys. So you have your, you know, this one key, you know, you can bake, you can, you know, you can spend your tokens. The other key is a manager key where you just send your uh, rights to participate in proof of stake via that key. And that you can, with, via that you can send, uh, you know, you can delegate your, your proof of stake uh, rights to a delegate. And then that delegate typically sends you back uh, a share of the inflation that they're getting uh, by producing and endorsing blocks. And so the idea actually in Tezos is that this actually aligns the incentives of all uh, network participants. So if you're going to have something like an on-chain governance uh, mechanism, you want everybody to be uh, on, a, on a relatively even footing in terms of like dilution by inflation or uh, you know, their, their overall interest in the protocol. Um, and so you have like you, you try to remove the diff, the class this notion of class between users. Like if you have you know in EOS you have big block producers who and then you have small token holders. In in Tezos the, the distinction is much smaller. Um, and we'll probably you know my my hope is that it would get smaller uh, over time. But you know maybe but the cool thing about something like a self amending ledger is that if we wanted to adopt the EOS uh, model we we could you know so I mean. The, the idea is, you know, incentive alignment rather, in the current Tezos uh, model, it's incentive alignment rather than actually, you know, it's, it's sort of the opposite of what people assume. Will, do you want to add anything to this or Steve? Um, I, yeah, I mean, maybe I, I can play devil's advocate on liquid democracy and, and systems where you can, you can very easily move influence among different groups of people. Uh, and so just a... Uh, Pre prefaces, I, so I, about six months ago, I, I was in the same camp where I was very excited about liquid democracy, and uh, but our, our research uh, fellow, Peter, who recently joined Zero X, kind of changed my mind on this, and his argument is that, you know, people have enough trouble participating in, uh, you know, elections and governance processes as it is uh, when there's like a regular cadence 
for you know elections in the United States, for example, uh, every two years, you know, you you can go and vote for uh, someone to represent you in your state. Uh, every four years, you elect a president, and people don't turn out. Now, imagine if you know, at any given moment, you might have some sort of governance, important governance decision to make, and it's your job to go and respond to that by showing up to vote. People just aren't going to do it. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. Like people just aren't gonna be able to, to dedicate that much of their attention and, and that much of their lives to, to participating in governance. So, you know, his argument, and I, I'm sort of tending to agree, but I think we should experiment, is that having elected representatives making important decisions within a community is probably a good thing. Yeah, basically, Jared, on that really boils down to, are you looking at uh, delegating to uh, sort of technocratic ideal or is it a special interest group? And there's a fine line between that. Yeah, I think that's right on. Um, and, and what I was going to say uh, is that um, I think what you, w w the way I look at, at blockchain protocols, and I think the way they'll especially evolve is that you'll basically always have two classes of users, people who are paying lots of attention to blockchain governance and people who are you know, not paying attention. And I think, uh, personally, I think the goal of blockchain governance in the long term will be that you know, there aren't that many, actually that many upgrades on the base layer, that uh, you actually uh, want it to be that the vast majority of token holders are not paying attention to, like that's how we'll know that this thing has been adopted widely, is like if people are using, you know, Centralized applications and and you know using you know smart contract based uh, tools and, and and financial instruments and stuff without ever caring about you know what uh, you know Baker X vote how they voted in on chain governance and I think. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the goal is to have accountability on these, you know, maybe a smaller group of, of you know, ho hopefully not too small, like something like EOS, but some, some uh, smaller group than the total number of token holders um, that are paying attention to how things are going and actually have to worry that they'll either lose, uh, you know, some delegation uh, or some amount of tokens uh, delegated to them uh, or that, in t you know, that by destroying the system that, uh, token holders will just leave that, like if it's Tezos, we'll just leave Tezos and go to another uh, uh, protocol, uh, you know, network. So I think I think there's, I think that's like where we're headed, and I think uh, it'll be really interesting to see whether or not this turns into multiple classes of users who are misaligned in their interests, or if they're just multiple different classes of users in terms of their amount of participation and how involved they are in the, the governance. Perfect. So with the recent investment into Maker, actually, by Andreessen, brings up an interesting question of uh, these funds and various venture capitalists play roles in governance. Um, I was kind of curious in what do you think, how will these guys either help or you know, be ineffective in the governance models? Yeah, so um, I'll make this brief because I want to hear what Steve has to say. Uh, but basically, I think that there is a huge uh, importance on uh, making sure that the, the, the token distribution is pretty fair from this respect. Uh, you know, obviously, investors have a moral responsibility to behave uh, well with the tokens that they have. They also have a financial responsibility to make as much money as possible, and these uh, incentives really do clash sometimes. I've even uh, spoken to investors who have discovered that uh, they can use that undue influence over some protocol to uh, make changes happen. Uh, and that's something you really have to watch out for, because a lot of developers are thinking, like, oh, there's no way that... Uh, the, these guys are going to have like that big of an influence and that many tokens, such a high proportion, and do you know bad things to our protocol. But it really is something that can happen if you're not careful. Yeah, I, so I, I can see both sides. So first, I think you know I know this firsthand that starting a, a company or a project where you have many people working together and collaborating with each other, it's really hard if if you don't have experience doing that. And having you know some people that have just seen this happen over and over again, hundreds of times, uh, is extremely valuable. So I'm, I'm sure the people at Andreessen are invaluable when it comes to providing guidance around how to structure your org and grow it, and how to recruit, and how to get executives that can come in and, and make changes that will maximize the probability of success. But I think on the other hand, like you know, at the end of the day, like if you know if Maker wins and the maker is the de facto stable coin that the world runs on like i'm pretty sure if if the the token holders are th that are making the decisions are investors they're going to be like trying to like maximize their rents as much as possible uh and they can and they'll have a very strong network effect that allows them to uh to do that so i yeah i think it's you know it's something that you got to be careful about 
yeah, and, and uh, you know, before I hand it over to you, um, the the main uh, thing to me is actually, I, I think I'm less. I find that you know that you know Andreessen Horowitz is involved in this like less interesting than this larger question around around stable coins, which is that you know if there's a hard kind of the, the, a big argument around Ethereum is that you know that actually uh, you know not having formal governance is okay because people can choose uh, to go with a different fork uh, very easily. But I actually think uh, that you know having stable coins and having uh, things like Infura and uh, you know coin you know what which uh, which fork a, uh, a major exchange picks uh, you know and then if you, the more people you add to skin in the game on some of these, you know, uh, entities that are built on top of some, you know, sp specific fork of a protocol, uh, the harder it will be for that argument to be true. Uh, so I'm really, I, I think that's going to be really interesting to see, think to see as well is like how much of an impact does this have on the larger Ethereum uh, governance uh, rather than just like maker governance. Should I answer this one? <laughs> there we are. Time. So the, the effect is this. Firstly, I do come from a finance background, so the first thing that uh, you know, behooved me was to look at their structure and say, well, ultimately, what are you trying to do in your portfolio? Because are we just an asset or are we a part of an overall structure that you're trying to create? And the answer is we are a part of an overall structure they're trying to create. There are those influences that we have to look out for, but those influences, as I mentioned before, the cartel, the basically the science is protected by the scientific governance. And Dreesen are not going to come along and tell us to turn ourselves into an ice cream factory because if that happens and they're successful, the system closes down. That is the simple aspect of it. But in essence, the thing you've got to understand about Andreessen is that this is the A16 crypto core portfolio, which is effectively focused on partnership. It really is a case of getting synergy through the various services and acknowledging the fact that we can actually offer each other a lot of opportunity in this space. I think uh, that's all the time we have, or if not, we're already over time, but uh, thanks everyone for coming out, and I think these guys will be around if you guys have some questions. Thank you. Thanks.